Good afternoon. Welcome to this new building, to uh, our series in this new building, I should say. It's known as the Musician's Church, if anybody's interested. Uh, we were just talking, you can find um, Henry Wood's ashes and many other musical monuments in this side, side chapel, very much used for concerts, and I'm very familiar with this building from uh, rehearsals, so it is um, London's Musician's Church, and therefore different style of architecture from the style we uh, were familiar with last year in Spitalfields, but equally appropriate to the, the business of music. I should just say a word, I think, about the complete program of the year, because I wanted to invent a new letter of the alphabet. I wanted to have a, um, a letter that was an N with an extra cross piece in it, a double letter which doesn't exist, so that you could have both um, content and context, because there's very little um, chance in music, I think, of getting away in practical terms from the business of um, the context of music and the content of music. Academically, you might be able to defend it. In practical terms, um, the two are very bound up. So it came out as the end, in the end as music in context. And so what I'll be dealing with in these six lectures is a question both of the setting in which music takes place, or was designed to take place, and also the, the provocation that makes the, the music happen in the first place. That's the, its reason for existing, and also the place in which it happens to exist. Um, not all music has an abstract purpose, of course. We tend to glorify music as being um, the art which is most abstracted from things that pull it down to worldly or verbal levels. Um, there are many reasons for music happening which are not quite as abstract as you might like. There can be music for teaching, you can have music for dancing, you can, as you will find in a later lecture, music for advertising, for filling any blank space, in fact. Um, it can act as a vehicle for virtuosity rather than having any real content. It can also advertise the wealth of the patron, the person who is paying for it at the creative moment. And of course, you'll remember that the Goldberg Variations by Bach were written to fill the sleepless moments of an insomniac employer. So there, there are many functions that uh, music can fulfill in addition to it being good music. I think you can never escape really from the historical facts that music has an origin um, that may not be the entire story, but it has to be uh, taken on board. And we hope that um, the um, origin will not be the whole story of the piece, but it's, it's an essential component of its DNA. Um, sometimes it can lift itself above the start, as you'll find, I think, with music designed in the first instance for advertising, or music designed in the first place for uh, being teaching material rather than concert material. I suspect in the end when we have done these six different topics that you find listed in your program that we'll conclude that good music can rise above its origins or its context and less good music may be better understood in terms of how it originated. So we're all gainers really in this business. It is possible, of course, to have music which arises from uh, no particular objective and with no great background intention. Simply good, pure, simple, abstract music that will come out. Um, that example I put at the end of the year's sequence, it's the Schubert Quintet, <clears throat> which seems to me to have no reason for having been created or for existing other than it was just wonderful music which had to be written. Um, but lacking any other context, it has purely content. Um, the remainder of the pieces, I think, in the year you'll, um, you'll see can be all taken out of their first context, 
and set up in any other. But they'll, nevertheless, they'll always carry the hallmark of these origins to some extent, and we'll look more deeply into what happens at the originating stage. Um, you'll have realized after three years of hearing me talking on music that I'm not a great advocate of this uh, sort of warm bath approach to uh, music. Nice, you know, just lean, lean back, relax, and let it wash over you. Um, I suspect uh, you are on my side in this, that it, um, I think you want to know more about it. Um, we'll try to provide more about it and also a healthy proportion of live music played by uh, members of the Royal Academy of Music who will um, be providing the music in all six of these, these lectures. And I think that's the, the digging into this music and the hearing it played live are the two main facets, I think, of this series. Notice, just as a warning, um, that this year we're on different days of the week. I'm told to remind you that although we're Friday today, you'll see on the list that other lectures happen on Thursdays and one rogue lecture happens on a Wednesday. So please don't come to the Wednesday lecture on a Thursday here or you'll find something else going on, although it'll quite possibly be musical, as I say, because this is a musician's church and much used for the preparation of music. Um, our starting point today is Messian and the quartet for the end of time. I think it would be hard to guess from its title or from listening to it, if anybody already is familiar with this piece, um, they, you wouldn't guess that its origin was a prisoner of war camp, a concentration camp. I think um, it may look a shocking way of starting a series, but it certainly points up um, the business of the context and the, the, in the starting DNA of this music. Concentration camp in most people's mind takes you to Teretzin, Theresienstadt, the most famous of the camps in the last war, which was set up um, in what is now the Czech Republic as a specific place for grouping musicians. It had symphony orchestras, opera companies, um, a number of composers went there and never came back from there. So you, you have um, names like um, Schulhoff and uh, Haas and Gideon Klein. Um, that is a well-publicized end of classical music, I think, in the wartime regime. The one we're dealing with today is not so extreme, but it could have felt similarly dangerous to the people involved. This is uh, 1940s France. Um, it's the Germans have just arrived on the scene. The English have just left the scene via Dunkirk. And lots of French were moving around trying to get away from the threat of being found in Paris when the Germans arrived. Messiaen was amongst these people. He was just in his early, I think he was 31. Um, and he and thousands of others were trying to clear the capital. Um, in Messiaen's case, he was found in a wood near Nancy, along with many others, and the wood was surrounded. He was taken away first to a, a sort of holding camp where he found one clarinetist friend of his, um, and then they were all eventually moved on to a camp called Stalag 8A, um, which is uh, close to Dresden. Um, luckily, it was not as dire as one might have thought. Messiaen was quite lucky. He carried very little with him, um, but the little he did have with him included a score of the Brandenburg Concertos and a score of, of music by Berg. So he was not badly supplied. And the situation he found in this Stalag 8A was that the commandant was perfectly agreeable to him being given paper and writing materials and able to compose. At first, there was no piano. And even when there was a piano, um, it was pretty dire, as I'll tell you later, but he had a clarinetist friend, there was a violinist with a violin, and there was a cellist um, with three strings on the cello, not four, and they somehow had to bargain for an extra string being found so that this uh, could make 
something unusual for Messiaen, who, who doesn't go in for writing chamber music, basically. This was enforced by the situation, so very much the context in which this piece started was one of deprivation, and um, Messiaen was reduced to the four instruments that he had. He himself said that he composed, to, first of all, to escape from the snow, from the war, from captivity, and from myself. The greatest benefit, he said, that I drew from it all was that in the midst of 30,000 prisoners, it was a very big holding camp, this, I was not one. So his view of music for the imprisoned is that it sets you free. Um, he composed the piece, as I say, around the facilities he had, very slight, very poor. Um, he eventually got an upright piano moved in, but he did say, when you put the keys down, many of them did not come up again. Um, this could be a reason that some of the music is extremely slow in this piece, but not in all movements where it really moves on. He explains the first concert where they gathered together um, 5,000 prisoners, and Messiaen says he was sitting at this upright piano with many keys not functioning and his three friends around him. He was dressed, he said, in rags and tags, part of a, of a Czech army uniform. He was wearing clogs. And the audience of 5,000, he said, included all classes, peasants, laborers, intellectuals, career soldiers, medics, priests, etc. Um, priests come at the end of the list, but they have, they have an important bearing on whole concept. Um, the title is not as clear, I think, in English as it would have been in French. Quatre pour la fin de temps. We call it Quartet for the End of Time, but to a French speaker, it could be the end of time. Um, also, it could be the end of tempo and measured time. Speed. It has, has more, ton has more musical references in French than, than in English. And I find Messiaen's language quite, it's quite easy to pull apart and describe, and he found so himself. He wrote acres describing his technique of composing and his particular musical language. Uh, what I can't do and won't start to do is try to explain what it is and how it works. But we can show you some examples. So musicians, you can gather yourselves up here and we can pull out a few plums from this piece. This is more the, um, the content than the context, but I think Messiaen's language um, is something that one can sink oneself in quite happily. His written language is, I have to say, very rich and goes almost completely over my head. But I will give you a few quotes and you can see whether you think his view of his own music in any way answers up to what you feel or hear when, when you absorb it. Do you want to do a little tuning? Maybe that will start us. In the first instance, this quartet exists because this is what happened to be. So it's a, a, the absolute starting point of writing this piece to Messiaen was not one of choosing a quartet. Um, it's not something I think he ever found congenial. There's hardly any chamber music from Messiaen at all. He lived a long life and um, died in the 90s, but he wrote much church music, organ music, large orchestral music, um, only one other piece that could really be classified as, as uh, chamber music. So this was imposed upon him. The elements of his language, though, he had already worked out well in advance. He'd held a position in Paris as an organist. He was a, a prodigy, both performer and, and composer. He was intellectual in, and 
also um, re of religious fervor that goes a long way beyond what most people dream of. And his imagery for Mutefort, religious experiences, um, blends in, into um, a type of description which is very suited to the book of Revelations. It is beyond most people's vision. He invented and controlled the forces of musical language in a way that are very particular to him, although he was a very experienced teacher and had many pupils. Not many people adopted the musical language and vocabulary and rules that Messiaen himself laid out for his own composing. Um, we'll make, take a few uh, spot examples. There's the question of the harmonies that he used. He worked on what he called a modal system, so not normal scales and tonalities that you are accustomed to in classical and baroque and classical and, and early romantic music, wafting away into strings of, of you would previously have said impressionistic harmonies. Messiaen never did. He always linked them to a very strictly controlled sequence of repeated possibilities. And the sort of chords you get are the sort of chords that the piano first plays in the very first movement of this piece. slightly eerie sense of um, being neither resolved nor completely unresolved. Uh, that is, all of them have a very luscious French quality. I think they, they sound nice as individual pieces. But do you really feel that one has to move on to the next chord? And when you got to the next chord, do you really feel it's got to move on to some chord following? Or is it a world in itself? Just play them again and, and let's have lots of time between each one and see whether you think that could be the end or it really insists that another chord has to fulfill it. it. <laughs> there could have been a lot. The, the language I find is very attractive. The chords themselves are very sensual. The obligation to move from one to another, to, to have harmonic tension and resolution, hardly appears in there at all. Um, you can connect all this, of course, with the, the idea of the end of time, or better probably, um, there shall be no more time, as the book of Revelation says. When the concept of time is finished, then you cannot have a first chord that has to resolve onto a second chord, because each could last an eternity. That's one element of his harmonic language, and there's a modal element, very complicated if you want to, um, to pursue it through his own writings. He'll explain to you why notes follow each other in um, a very preordained and cleverly worked out system which is as strict as the normal um, scales and harmonies that we are accustomed to in, in classical and early romantic music but of a, in a different language. Rhythm um, is another thing where Messiaen throws us slightly. He was very interested in prime numbers, so things like 5, 7, 11, so on. 5, 7, 11 and other prime numbers are not the numbers you are most familiar with in normal, standard, classical, baroque, romantic music. You'll be dealing in 4 or 8 <clears throat> and something that you can march to and something where the pulse stays on a predictable basis. That is, if the Toreador starts singing e dum da dum dum yum da dum you're pretty sure it's going to go on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so on. Much of the time, there is a, the feeling that the march of time has already been measured out. 
and you know where the next beat is going to fall and you can march or dance or anything else that you use functional music for in with a, a fair degree of being sure that the thing is not going to sh suddenly shift its, its measure. Um, Messiaen saw no need for this and one of his ways of freeing up one of the other interpretations at the end of time it was an end of measured time, as the French would say, what is the pulse of the piece. And a march can go one, two, three, four. And if we want normally extra notes in our march, we do it by stealing from a long note and, in, and inserting it while on the run. So you can have one and two and three and four. One and a two and a three and a four. Um, Messiaen equally simply, but more unusually to our ears would say if you wanted this extra note you just add it in so you get one two and three four and five six and however and then he groups his pulses according to his principles of um, prime numbers and a great interest in eastern musics um, Indian Hindu music uh, the music of the gamelan Indonesian music um, constructs which which give a rhythmic shape to things uh, which is impossible to dance to i think is the first thing can, can, could you possibly dance to any any movement from this piece i think you never are quite sure where your feet are going to fall because you've reached the end of time and there is no guarantee that time is going to exist in the next bar and, and you will stumble but the requisite number of notes that are needed for his modal system will be there it's a nice way, in fact, of separating the concept of, of the rhythmic power of the piece and the, the melodic power of the piece. Normally, we're used to these two being more or less integrated, and strong beats and strong notes in melodies fall on requisite beats of the bar. Now, for Messiaen, he can stretch the number of notes in the bar and the length of the bar exactly as far as he wants it to go. Uh, with all the extra notes inserted as extras, not accommodated within the, this pulse. So I defy anybody to stand up and dance to this music or even to beat time successfully to this music. He just adds, I can't say randomly, but even he admitted that all the tricks he was using and the rules he had made for the music were not things you had to carry in your head or expect to hear. And as the music proceeded, they were explanations um, of how it, its um, DNA had been controlled. A particular example, I think, is useful because it's not a modern example. That's um, things that operate on a rhythmic pattern. Uh, this was known even to medieval composers. You take a random formulaic uh, system of, of um, beats, say 2 plus 7 plus 3 plus 9, four plus something and they build up and then you reverse them so in fact you have a palindrome you reach the middle of your piece and then towards the end of the piece these this numerical sequence reverses on itself well of course you don't know that when you're listening to the piece because music does operate in the march of time however much uh, Messiaen would like to switch off time music occurs like this it doesn't all occur at one moment and so, how are you to know that the sequence of numbers you're meeting now, even if you heard them, is going to come at you in reverse in four or five minutes' time? These are constructional things, um, and he was the first person to say, this is not something either players um, have to be incredibly aware of, nor should uh, a listener perhaps at all be aware of. One other um, element that is very strong and begins, I think, in this piece of Messiaen later becomes a very strong facet in, in his musical vocabulary, um, and that's birdsong. He, de he decided that the, the songs of individual birds, which he catalogued and notated later, um, birds he decided were the opposite of time. Um, it's a slightly gnomic saying, um, but he saw that it is true, you cannot beat time to a bird singing. The bird will sing for as long as a symphony orchestra plays, but the symphony orchestra you can measure off in bars and beats. Bird song, very rarely, although it is clearly um, constructed and controlled, and every year we find people um, 
changing our definition of what we used to call bird-brained by showing us that the birds actually are much cleverer than we thought they were, and there are amazing mathematical sequences in their bird song, just the same as in their heads. They have the ability to navigate from Scotland to North Africa and back and reach the tree they left last year. Um, that isn't a bird brain, I think, doing that in the conventional sense. Messian then co combines all these things. Let's just listen, shall we, to a little bit of the very first movement of uh, this piece, the Liturgy of Crystal. He has um, some quite highfalutin descriptions of what's going on in, in uh, all this stuff. But here's, here's a combination of the elements that, that we've heard. There's the clarinet. Um, you're playing expanded music, it's undanceable, unmeasured music because of these little notes. Um, the violin is being bird song at this time. The cello is just supplying sort of icing at this moment, I think. Um, unless, can you, can you defend it on any other grounds? Very beautiful harmonics, effects music, effects music. And the piano is, is delivering these modal chords, every one of them very carefully calculated. No one of them, I feel, demanding more explanation. But yet, every time there is a, a following chord, it feels correct. There's absolutely nothing, I think, in that to suggest the context of a prisoner of war camp. So you have content, context, completely um, divorced there. There is, of course, in all Messiaen's descriptions of what he's doing, in all his music, a very strong theological content, and you can see in your programs from the titles 
um, of the, the movements in the Quapor, that almost all of them um, derive from something or other to do um, with the Book of Revelations. And he said that in the little lecture he gave these um, um, prisoners before the first performance in sub-zero temperatures, he says, I told them, first of all, that this quartet was written for the end of time, not as a play on words about the time of captivity, uh, but for the ending of concepts of past and future. That is, for the beginning of eternity, much mentioned in the, in the titles. And in this, I relied on the magnificent text of the book of Revelations. Well, he, he was quite selective with his uh, text from the, the book of Revelations but he quotes certain chunks of it. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud and rainbows upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire, and his left foot on the earth. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and said, and swore by him that lived forever and ever that there should be time no longer and in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he should begin to sound the mystery of God should be finished he was selective with what he took from the from revelations but you can see the, um, the concept of what is there the other thing that he um, gets quite expansive about in his descriptions of what he had in his mind uh, was the question of color. Again, um, I can report this to you and we can um, note that this is, this is what he felt about it. He said during his captivity, it was colored dreams which gave birth to the chords and rhythms of my quatuor. Um, and he writes what amounts to a sort of literary fantasy in itself, um, explaining the sort of colors that he had in his mind, um, giving a little sample. He said, for me, the first transposition of mode two, this was what was underneath those harmonies you first saw, um, is defined like this. Blue violet rocks speckled with little gray cubes, cobalt blue, deep Prussian blue, highlighted by a bit of violet purple, gold, red, ruby, and stars of mauve, black and white, blue, violet is dominant. Uh, that's already quite a handful of colors. Um, the thing is when it's then, this mode, these modes could be just transposed up and down the keyboard, you hear them in different transpositions. Moving up a semitone, the same mode, which I think I and many people would just read as being the same sequence of harmonic clusters, comes out as completely different colors. He, he admits it totally different and this time he says one semitone higher it's gold and silver spirals against a background of brown and ruby red vertical stripes golds and browns are dominant in the next transposition of semitone up you get light green and prairie green foliage with specks of blue silver and reddish orange dominant is green and so it goes on sounds rather like an interior decorating brochure or a fashion house handout, but these are amazing visions that he, he finds the colors are part of the translated version of what he is writing musically. Maybe some people can hear such chords as such specific colors and also the differences when they transpose. I can't vouch for it except that I know I don't, although I do like those strings of descriptions and colors. And I think if you listen to those individual chords and think that to some people they consist of all these clusters of colors, then every chord could take on a slightly different refracted color. Um, so that's another of his, his components. Whether it's a, a hell, sometimes I think the, these things that mystics explain to us um, sometimes the explanation is more problematic than leaving the original mystic vision unexplained but still it's the world the world of interconnections i think that makes a fashion fascination in itself so you have this picture in his mind of given colors given modes harmonies strange additive rhythms that cannot be danced to this is the world's most undanceable music um, 
and this question of is it the end of time or just the absence of time? Time shall, what Revelation says, is time shall be no more. So it's not like you're arriving at the end of the world or the end of your imprisonment, it's just an, an absence of time. Um, birds have this view, birds' song has this view um, uh, to Messia, and one of the movements um, in the piece is given entirely to the solo clarinet, uh, which is the Abyss of Birds. We have time for yes, I think we can. If you could offer us this one. This is pure, a purely solo um, declamation on the ideas of the modes, the pictures of an abyss, maybe. It's hard sometimes to know how, how picturesquely, figuratively, or literally <clears throat> you should interpret the line of the music. But certainly, I think almost everybody, birdsong is birdsong. It's unmeasurable, it's undanceable, but it's certainly absolutely recognized.
might think <clears throat> that could have been extemporized. It's not totally notated. It has all the double characteristics of the complete range of clarinet, which is an extraordinary range anyway for the effects of a bis. It has the double character of a clarinet playing and a bird singing. He has a full range of precisely notated. I think that nothing, nothing is left to chance there. I think it's one. <clears throat> you, would, you might not know that. But now let's go to the, the um, sixth movement of the piece. You, um, we have to skip for, for little examples. Here's the um, dance of fury. The seven trumpets, which Messiaen said, Sam, you, you should hear gongs and colours of all sorts. Um, the point of this is that all instruments play, but there's only one line. The whole thing is a, I must say, I think, nerve-wracking uh, experiment in synchronising. <clears throat> because one slip and you are dead. <clears throat> it goes fast and it has these additive rhythms, so there's no way of you measuring the pulse in equal uh, segments. And it really is, it's full of the imagery and the, the colours that, that Messiaen had in his head. But unlike the clarinet solo, this is everybody playing practically all the time and fingers crossed totally in unison or octaves.
improved, they can operate absolutely as equals. We now go on to them operating entirely in free space and no time.